Are you the kind of person that slaves away at making your music just right, but then you get shy when it's time to promote it and actually sell it? Well then, this video is for you. I go behind the scenes of the Rustic Songbird podcast where I interview Greg LaFollette about his strategy and what's worked for him to show up real and authentic when he's promoting his music without sounding salesy or cheesy. So you're gonna get a lot out of this interview and I hope that you enjoy our conversation. You can check out more episodes and the whole list of previous episodes at rusticsongbird.com forward slash podcast. Okay, let's jump into the interview. My guest on the show today is Greg LaFollette. He is a singer songwriter, recording artist, and he is on the show today to share some of his story and also some tips for songwriters and musicians about promoting your music with authenticity and with integrity. And I found Greg through Instagram, actually. And he does really well promoting his music on Instagram because I found it, obviously. And um, so as I was looking into his music, I really enjoyed the sound of it. It's good quality. And he's also promoting it in a way that uh, is just real to who he is and authentic. And I thought, wow, this is a great example of somebody who's just doing it and doing it well. So Greg, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. I'd love to hear how you got started in music and how you discovered your unique sound. Like, what was that process like? Uh, well, I, I mean, I'll say I think uh, your sound or your, your thing finds you uh, more than you find it. And whether you like it or not, and for better or worse, <laughs> like, I think it's, it's an amalgam of... Uh, you know, what your primary caretakers listened to when you were a child, what the cool kids in middle school listened to, uh, the tape your older brother hid from your parents, you know, what your college roommate blew your mind with freshman year, um, the, the song that uh, accompanied your first heart, heartbreak, soundtrack, soundtrack of the best summer of your life, those sorts of things. That's mm -hmm. what, that is your sound. Um, and so for me, the, the first tapes, I can remember having cassette tapes. I got them in my Easter basket um, when I was five or six years old. But uh, uh, my f the first tapes I can remember having were, were ACDC, Back in Black, and New Kids on the Block, hang, Hanging Tough. Not wow, hanging throwing tough. it back there. <laughs> in your Easter basket. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So... <laughs> Um, my parents listened to, you know, what is now called classic rock, um, the Beatles, Eagles, Bob Seger, um, in middle school, uh, the cool kids listened to, uh, Bone Thugs and Harmony. Do you know any of these artists? Are they all way too? I didn't recognize the last one. That may have been like okay. just a different thing. My, my dad listened to Elvis and my mom listened to Amy Grant. So that's kind of the genres that I grew up listening to. So nobody, you know, listened to Bone Thugs and Harmony. Then. Probably not. No. Probably not, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I listened to like gangster rap in, uh, in middle school to fit in. Uh, and in college, I had a roommate. I'd never listened to kind of classic singer songwriters like James Taylor, Bob Dylan, and uh, more recent ones like Counting Crows. Um, so that's sort of some of the my musical influences that have shaped, I think, my output, the, the art that I make. So um, I think my unique sound is kind of a continuum on which all these influences lie. So I really enjoy Taylor Swift. I enjoy her music and I really enjoy Jackson Brown's music. Um, so when I'm writing a song or making a record, depending on what will serve the song best, I can draw from any of those things, um, whether gangster rap or singer, you know, singer songwriter. So I have a sign in my studio that says uh, WWTPD, what would Tom Petty do? <laughs> so like uh, I, I uh, refer to that. Um, I, and, I, and something uh, in thinking about this question, I'll say the process is a lot like, it's a lot like life and becoming um, the truest versions of ourselves. Like we have all of these influences, all of these experiences. Um, we have input from before we were even aware that shapes who we are. 
Um, and like I said about music, whether we like it or not, and for better or worse. So we have our DNA and um, the relational climate of the place we grew up in, approval or disapproval of our teachers when we're young, um, cruel, scarring words in middle school, rejection from people that we want to like us, um, uh, warm embrace from elderly people at church. You know, these are things that make us who we are. Um, uh, and so it's, it's actually, it's kind of like that whole art imitating life thing. Um, mm -hmm. It feels, it feels similar, like, um, in that we don't really get to control um, the kind of artist we become, um, at least initially. Um, we get to make decisions out of it, but initially it's sort of like, here are, here's my pool of resources that is unique to me because my dad listened to this kind of music and because the old people at church were nice to me. Um, and we can grow from there and make choices from there, but the pool is the pool, you know? Yeah, I love that. I'm really glad you brought that up because I've talked to several people lately who are like, I just don't know what my sound is or like what my unique style is. I like a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And so I'm glad you brought that up because it is like a melting pot of all of these different influences, the things that we've been exposed to, whether we were looking for that or not, whether it was just around in our family or our friend groups. Um, my mom studied voice in college and she was pregnant with me before she graduated. So she was like practicing for her senior recital while I was in the womb and I was hearing that kind of music. And so she was singing classically, but she was also uh, learning the uh, six, eight rhythm. And so in school, they would have to like pat it out over and over and over and have that repetition. So they were learning that and that became like my internal rhythm. Hmm. Where when I play with the band, if they started out, they'll start off in four, four. And if I started out, I started out in six, eight or two against three. And I can't help it. Like now I know it, but I was doing that when I was just getting started playing guitar at like 12 years old. And I didn't know what I was doing or like why it was off. You know, people were like, oh, that's kind of different. <laughs> and I didn't like know why. Is in six, eight or something. Yeah. It is. It's like that influenced <laughs> me from birth and I had no control over that. But it's really cool because it's become part of who I am and how I express my music and so I think it's really neat how those things all come together and that's what makes our unique sound mm -hmm. yeah that is sure. so cool well I know your faith is a big part of that and you do some worship music so how did that come into uh, starting songwriting and making your own original music um yeah I you know I've um I've made music since high school um, and in college, uh, and, and well, I'll say in high school, pretty quickly, I was thrown into church music, leading worship and youth group and, and those sorts of things. Um, and that was really good for picking up chicks, let me tell you, you know, so I was pretty into it. Um, but uh, so, so that's always kind of been a part of my musical journey, even my first band. Um, it would be like originals and then when we ran out of songs we would play you know as the deer or <laughs> from the secret or whatever um and so it's always kind of been a part um in college i actually studied music ministry for a couple of years and um kind of, i i just for some reason i just always thought i wanted to minister kind of outside of uh the vocation uh, having a vocation inside of the church and so for the next 15 years, I worked in studios and on the road and um, obviously um, uh, had a relationship with God and throughout all of that, but it was just a different, um, a different kind of ministry, a different kind of representing Christ, sharing Christ. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, I, I actually, um, I made a, a solo record that I intended to be kind of a singer songwriter, expressive, you know, emotional, emotive record. And, um, and I felt like I succeeded in it. But what happened was all the songs were kind of congregational worship songs like Psalm 27, which you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I've been listening to that one really enjoyed that one. 
and and it was it was sort of like I was able to really like share my heart and say the things I wanted to, but it was also like straight from the Psalms or in in a lot of other people's words. And I realized like these are my words and this is my heart. And so um, I released I I wrote that record and released it. And then um, from there, because of kind of the usefulness of the songs, because they could be used in churches and were very um, congregational in nature you know, um, I was able to, uh, I had a few people ask me if I would be interested in working, um, leading worship at their, at their, um, churches, and so, um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got into it, and then I really flourished as a, as a songwriter and as an artist in that, um, uh, in that job, uh, of serving people with music. It, It helped me realize, like, oh, I can be an artist, kind of in a different way than I've um, thought about it before. Like, uh, I don't have to be an artist um, who kind of comes in and takes over and says, here's my thing, it's good, trust me on it. Um, I could kind of go in as an artist and say, like, how can I serve you? I'm pretty good at writing songs, I'm pretty good at, at expressing um, a group conscious conscience, and uh, I, um, I, for me, helping is really life-giving. So how can I help you with what I'm good at, with the, with the skills and talents that I've been given and that I've fostered throughout the years? And I really uh, feel like I flourished in that um, and wrote a hundred songs since I started that job a couple of years ago and, um, and that sort of thing. So uh, like, uh, it's a typical story, life happens and, you know, you get up and reassess, and I found myself at a church in the midst of a long musical career, so, yeah. Wow, I love the perspective of that, of serving the audience and serving, like, what is my listener going to get out of this? I think so many times we get uh, stuck at the part of, like, what am I trying to say? What is my sound? Um, I know I went through times like that of trying to be original and all that, but really it's the simplest ideas that relate to people and that connect. And so just saying that in your own way or in a new way, um, or just breaking something down to a simple thought, I think is more relatable to people. And so having that perspective of service is really yeah. neat because you're constantly going back and saying, okay, now what, where are you at now? What do you need? And hearing yeah. their responses to those songs that you put out and then seeing, okay, well, what's the next step? And then write towards that. I mean, you can do that writing for a certain congregation or you can do that writing for your audience. So those people that are following your music and you're writing it for them with them. And it's like, here you go. Here's what you asked for. Here's what you need. That's amazing. Yeah. I think as artists, uh, that is one way of doing it. I I think there is a kind of art where it's just good to express yourself and let people digest it um, and take it in 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 whatever way they want to. I think as if there are worship leaders listening, I think it is our job to continually be asking, what do my people need? Where 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 are they hurting? And how can I address that in song, in how I set up the service, in the kinds of prayers I, I choose for the service. Those, that is the job, and much more than having the band on the click, you know? So that's my, you know, I can speak a lot more about that, but I'll Yeah, I, I wanted to hear uh, your perspective first and like your heart behind it, because when someone is putting their music out there, like it is such a, uh, such a scary thing because you're like, oh, I hope people like it. You know, it's something you've created. It's like, this is my baby. I want, I want it to go out and like help a lot of people and stuff. Um, and so having that attitude, I think really shifts things instead mm-hmm. of like, oh, do you like it to, I made this for you. You know, mm-hmm. it's just totally a different, a different uh, transfer, you know, a different uh, way of coming across. And so you're basically inviting mm-hmm. people to come into your world. Like you're inviting people to listen to this song. It's not like, Hey, look at me. It's not flashy. It's like, Hey, I made this. And if you want to listen to it, it's here, you know, it's so different. So different. So let's speak to that. Like how did that develop into 
kind of your strategy for promoting your own music without seeming inauthentic, you know, with being true to yourself and true to what the music is, how did that process look? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that segued nicely. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, I think the most crucial part of this for artists is dif differentiating ourselves from our art, um, who we are from what we do. And this is specific to artists um, particularly, but it's true of everyone. It's true of CEOs in a business context. It's, um, uh, it's not easy to do, to, to separate who we are from what we do. Um, for a lot of us, music is what we are best at, um, what we've received the most praise and affirmation for. Um, so it's really easy for us to tether our value to how people respond to our art. Um, it's not just, is the song good if I get a hundred likes? It's, it's ultimately, uh, am I good? <laughs> am, I, am I capital G good? Am I okay? You know, do you like me? Um, if, if we are not careful, we're giving that power to strangers to say, to tell us if we're good or not. Like people who ha have no real information about who we are. Um, and so we have to be really careful with it. I, I have to be really careful with it every day. It's really, it's a really difficult task. Um, but when I can take a step back um, and see that one of art's primary functions is to serve others, just like we just talked about, I can then promote it in a much more wholehearted way. I can say, I want you to hear this because I think it might help you or it might be useful to you or I think you might enjoy it without saddling the listener with the unfair responsibility of informing my worth and telling me if I'm ultimately good, you know, I can just make music, um, I can just make music, I can make art and art by nature is transactional. There is another party that sees it or hears it or feels it or experiences it in some way. Um, so, I, you know, once again, I make music intended to be used by churches in their services. So I'm able to separate myself from the purpose of the music and that definitely helps. It's not only the music, but even just the intention of the music. But, and, and I, I, um, I sympathize and I understand where you're coming from with it feeling weird or cheesy or over the top, but I think we have to, as artists, um, we have to think about what we're competing against for the attention of people. And it's like, um, pornography is over the top, you know, like you have to write a song that's more enticing than pornography that's hard you know it's over the top and and the promotion of it is over the top it's extreme you know pop music is cheesy it's i mean it's often shallow and cheesy and it's just repeated we like it um because we hear it five times and so often we just don't give music we don't choose to listen to a song five times in order to like it and what happens is on the radio or on a commercial on tv we just, um, without choosing, we hear a song multiple times and all of a sudden it's familiar enough that it's sort of like, oh, okay, I kind of like that. And it's not that that music is bad. It's really, you know, it's really proficiently created. It's, some of the best songwriters in the world are writing those songs, you know. Um, it's just, uh, it, they just have, I think um, pop music has the added, um, benefit of repetition often you know um so i think that that is a charge to us as artists to that you know our art has to rise above that stuff it has to be better than that if we if we really we can't feel like we can't get our feelings hurt if people don't listen if it's like well that's not as effective of a song it's not as good of a song or not as useful of a song um uh, so we we have to we have to demand attention by uh, raising the quality of our work. So quality always wins, even if it takes a hundred years for people to realize that and discover it. 
um, just yesterday, I was talking to my best friend and I said, what do you, what art or, or what kind of cultural contributions um, in the last 25 years, what, what cultural contributions do you think um, will still be relevant in like a hundred years, you know? Um, and we, we talked about like the telephone and how big of a deal that was um, for even like my parents' generation where before that it was like write a letter, wait a few weeks and hope to get a letter back sort of thing. And then the telephone happens and now um, kids don't know what a landline is. They've never seen a house telephone. Um, those sorts of those sorts of like technological advances um, are kind of interesting to, to think about. But I was I was sort of I pressed in and I was like, what kind of art? Like, who's going to be the person that we feel like marked um, this period of time, these 25, 30, 50 years? You know, what's going to stay around? You know, Paul Simon's going to stay around. He was in the 70s mostly. His music's if it doesn't, I'll do what I can to keep it alive, you know. Um, uh, I guess what I was getting at is it feels like the music made, particularly in the 60s and 70s, has a lot of staying power. It, it impacted culture so much that it will be around, but I wonder what in 1985 is going to be around and what in 2019 is going to be around. Like, who is making substantial art that has staying power. Um, and, and I guess that's what I meant in like, it might take a hundred years. It's sort mm -hmm. of like those authors or poets that, um, or painters that never sell a, a painting until they pass away. And then it's like, you know, um, they're in high demand. So um, I think there is a place for uh, art that has a short, shelf life and I really enjoy it sometimes <laughs> like I I can I really enjoy pop music and I'm uh, challenged by it and uh, and it's really hard to make it's really difficult to write that kind of music and to produce that kind of music but ultimately when I think about like what do I want to leave behind what legacy do I want to leave behind what do I want to say with my life you know um, that's where that's where kind of the higher quality piece comes in. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? I rambled a bit about quality. I yeah, I, th I think having that mindset of making the songs good enough quality to where they can live on, like a longevity, uh, thinking about impact and culture, I think that's super important because the music we make, we can leave behind and it can impact people way further past our lifetime. And so if you have that as a perspective, you're like, hey, I'm going for a legacy. I'm going for long term. I want to create something that can impact someone else's life. And then even if I'm not around, like this music can still speak to people. Mm -hmm. That's a whole bigger game than like, I'm going to put out a single this month and I hope people like it. <laughs> it's way deeper. There's way more uh, in, uh, there's way more intentionality in that of like what can i create that would impact culture and let's set the bar there and then even if you get halfway to that <laughs> like it's gonna make make a bigger splash than it would have if you didn't have that intention yes and i would say it, intention is the key it doesn't have to be that you want your music to be heard in 150 years or that you want it to impact culture it can be i want people to dance when they hear this or, or i want to um feel understood or I want to shock people out of their normality like their normal life that's okay too but I think it's good to have an like what are you trying to do and it's totally okay if it's like write a banger for the club okay cool go for that um it's it's really just about uh knowing what you're doing and be, then being able to focus toward that goal yeah your your goal for that song could be very simple it could be one thing like i want people to smile when they hear this i want it to make them tap their foot i want them to dance around and uh you know forget the stress that they were under that day you know just like take a break you know whatever that looks like um i think it's good to be able to express different things in different songs and so one song doesn't have to have all the things 
Yep. But you might have a project where you go this direction, then this direction, then you bring it all together. Mm -hmm. And so I think intentionality is really, really important for that. And then just thinking about um, what you're going to leave behind, like your art and what messages you want to put out in the world, I think gives us like that passion for the music. Because if we do it for the love of it, that's going to be expressed in how we talk about it. And so when we're saying, hey, I, I made this song and I'd like for you to listen to it, we're offering it to them knowing like, I put my heart into the message of this and I worked really hard to make it the best quality that it can. And so now there's no reason why you wouldn't want anybody to hear this song, right? So you're not like, well, I threw this together over the weekend. No, it's like, there's so much in this and I want to give this as a gift to the world. And then it's that invitation, it's that gift and not pushy. Yeah. And, and to be clear, I mean, as artists, it's never going to be one motivation for making art. It's going to be, yes, I want to make you smile. And yes, I want to put goodness into the world. It's also going to be always, um, I want to make my parents proud. I want to make a good living doing something I love. I want people to like me. I want to feel important. I want to have influence. I want to impact culture. I want people to know my name. It's always going to be both. And that's okay. It, what's important is that you recognize that, that your motives are uh, mixed and uh, varied. Um, and then, you know, from there, fr from the awareness of that, you can make decisions. But, um, but I think that's mostly our job is just to be aware that, yeah, I wanna make my parents proud. And of course I wanna help people. I mean, that's true of me, you know, I want, I want, um, I want to be attractive to people. I want to be lovable. I want to be well-loved. And I want to serve the church and glorify God. That's just, I mean, for better or worse, that's, that's me, you know? So yeah, and I, that's where your songs will come from. Yeah. It's from that and thought. Okay and it. yeah, yeah, it's good <laughs> to be self-aware of what is your reason for writing songs? What's your reason for putting it out in the world? And I think that's where the sense of authenticity comes from because people are like, oh, wow, he really does care about his audience. Oh, wow. He really does, you know, make sure to make it a good quality sound and everything he puts out is high quality, you know, and those things will follow as people are watching what you're doing. They're listening to your music. Um, then that's, what's going to shine through. Mm -hmm. And if we just think, oh, I'm going to put out one song and it's going to be stellar and it's going to be a top song and like everybody's going to love me. There's, <laughs> there's that that's, you know, pretty unrealistic um, because most, most songwriters, most artists are pretty much doing this as their lifelong journey. They're creating music and they're touring with it. They're creating music and then they're putting it out there. And it's kind of this process over and over, write, record, release. And then, you know, every year is so different. Like a year can change so many things in our life. And then we have more messages to say. And so to think like, I'll just put one thing out there and share it on my Facebook once and it's going to go big. You know, we've got to do the work behind the scenes there that nobody sees yeah. to get it to the people. So uh, I know that you're on different social media platforms. You're on Instagram because that's how I found you. Uh, mm -hmm. But what ways have you seen that have been working well for getting your music out there? Um, Spotify has had a huge, a huge impact on people's awareness of my music. And I think the streaming platforms are really good at curating for individual tastes. Um, being discovered by someone who's not looking for you, who's maybe like looking for someone else and um, wants to hear their new song and then you're on a playlist with that person. Uh, that's an invaluable benefit and something that's really, really hard to come by. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's not unlike, um, you know, buying a, a ticket to go see a headliner, to, to go see a concert and then falling in love with the opening act who you'd never heard of. It's, it's a similar, it's, it's the same uh, model. It's just a um, modern version of it, you know? Um, so I think, uh, you know, all those things are a little controversial, the, the streaming platforms and how little we get paid as songwriters. But for me, I, I mean, if I get any money, like basically, 
the reality is for me, I would do that for free. I, if someone would say, hey, I'm going to share your music with people who like music like yours, I would be fine with that for free. So I get whatever it is, two tenths of a cent or whatever. Right. A percentage of a cent. Like, yeah, I'm kind of like, ah, oh, that's, I'll take that, you know, it's okay. Well, it adds uh, up over time. And so with streaming, like it's so different than downloads where, you know, people hear it and they like it or they don't, and they might save it or they might uh, come back to it. And so it's such a great way for people to find you and yeah, to hear and your think, music in the first place. Yeah, exactly. I think all we can, all we can desire as artists is a chance. It's like, if people don't like our music, that's okay. You know, you're not yeah. going to be everybody's cup of tea, but if, if everyone could just give it 45 seconds even, um, and then make a decision. That's kind of all you're going for, I feel like, mm -hmm. in promotion as an indie artist is um, a chance. And then, yeah. and, and then if they don't like it, you, you're fine with that. If they do like it, that's great. Um, but that's the majority of the promotion I do is just getting people to give my music a chance, not necessarily saying, here's why you should like it, um, but just that, that kind of... Uh, opening of the door, the crack in the door that says, you know, um, they, yeah, they, uh, people listen and see if they like it. And I'm happy if they do that. Um, if they hate it after that, I'm totally happy. All I want is, is the chance to be heard sort of thing. And Spotify does that is really helpful with, with that Spotify and other streaming platforms, all those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Spotify is one of the big ones right now for sure and it depends on what genre you're in and kind of like who your target demographic is for who's actually listening and what platforms they're on to listen mm. but Spotify is definitely one of the top ones right now and I was talking with another songwriter who was saying I just want my music to speak for itself and I'm like that's great but you need to get it in front of people so it can speak for itself you know mm -hmm. and so Spotify is one of those things it's like hey, here's a song you might like because it's a similar artist to somebody that you've already listened to. And so, like you said, the algorithm is really smart at curating those playlists and putting it in front of ears of people that like that style of music anyway. And so it's really interesting to me how the shift is happening from like downloading music and listening on the radio and CDs to going to almost only streaming. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there's, there's some of it like, when I'm traveling and playing live, people still want to buy a CD, but they may or may not listen to that CD. They may actually listen to it on their phone, but they mm. just want to have that CD. And so like things are shifting there. And I think yeah. Spotify is really interesting just to see like how that's working. So how has your audience responded to you releasing a single at a time? I was really interested in that because a lot of my friends that are releasing music are going to more of a single driven way of releasing music than releasing a whole album. So what's your experience with that been? Well, I primarily do that for myself to keep myself dri driven. Otherwise I would only release, you know, big chunks of music maybe once a year or twice a year, very sporadically. So it's a way for me to keep creating and it's a way to stay on people's radar. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a common release strategy to release singles, um, in front of your, you know, full, uh, full collection. And, um, yeah, I, you know, all the information is out there on how to do that. Well, you can just Google, like, how do I successfully put out a record, you know, or, or whatever, um, how do I promote a record? Um, and there's lots and lots and lots of resources. So um, in anticipation of a full release, I'll release two or three singles um, to kind of drum up attention um, and just get people aware of not only the single itself, but that it is uh, uh, foreshadowing a bigger release. Um, uh, and, and then sometimes, a lot of times between releases um you know long plays uh i will release a single here or there just to um kind of like i said just stay relevant and say 
you know, not go dark for eight months while I'm creating the new record and no one really hears about it. Um, that's, a, that's a very, that's an easy temptation for us uh, to get super focused on the next thing. And I mean, it's, for me, it's like immediately. It's, it's like, okay, I release something. I'm done talking about it. I'm ready to, <laughs> to like move to the next thing, start creating the next thing. But I think it's really important and something I would, uh, you know, uh, encourage. Um, it's important for us as artists to really think about the promotion and the putting out of the record as a part of the creation process, not as like another thing. So I, I made lots of records throughout my life where I, I would be very, very proud of the product at the end, but my, all of my energy was gone. All of my creative energy was gone at that point. And so it just kind of like stopped there, you know? Um, but the last few releases, I've really built in time and effort and money and energy to um, putting out the record, to making people know about it. Because that is, mm -hmm. once again, a part of art. The transactional, um, experiential exchange is a part of the, of the music or of the art. And so I think it's really good to treat promotion as a part of creation and not as... Um, an extra thing. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, like you're making it with that in mind of like, I'm going to release this song by itself to lead up to something else. So it needs to make sense. And then you break that down into smaller pieces too. Yes. One thing I really liked about how you're promoting your singles on Instagram specifically is you would make a video announcement and post that on YouTube. I think you do a great job at that. And it's just short videos telling people about the song and they hear it from you. But you also did short clips and previews of the songs. You did um, like static, just images of some of the lyrics and you mixed those in. So I think that was really good because it's not all the same thing. And it wasn't like one post that said, okay, everybody go listen to my song. It was like, here's a preview of the song and now it's out and here I am talking about it and here I am playing it live. And then here's another lyric, you're changing it up. So you're not boring your audience. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so I think you do a good job of doing a little bit of different types of things to let people know about the song. And in marketing, people teach that you have to hear something over and over before you'll act on it. And so people might see your post and think, oh yeah, I should listen to that. And then they see it again. Oh yeah, I really should listen to that. And then they hear it again and they're like, all right, I'm clicking the button. So sometimes it takes a while to get them to actually hear it, even if they want to. They might think, well, like my sound's not on right now, so maybe tomorrow, or maybe when I'm like driving, I'll listen to music. And so people yep. put it off. And so it's not that you just post once and hope people see it, hope people find it. You're reminding them, saying, hey, just in case you missed it, or if you haven't listened to it yet, here it is again. And that's not going to be overpowering your audience because you're trying to get the attention, like you said. And only a small percentage of our followers are actually seeing our posts. And so if you're showing up regularly, you're going to start, you know, getting more traction with that. Uh, like when you post about your music and your, your singles and you're like, Hey, here's my music, go listen, listen to it. What do people have to say about it? Well, I'll say this. If people are, um, if people are put off by the amount that I post about it, I never hear about it really. Like it's all my inner voice saying like, oh gosh, I don't want to like inundate people. Yes, like I've posted this three times and everyone's right. seen it three times. No, they haven't. <laughs> right. And I'll say like, I feel that way sometimes. I feel like some people do overdo it and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm already listened or I don't care to listen or whatever. Um, but that inner voice of like saying like, who do you think it's, once again, it's four layers down for me, but mm -hmm. it's like, who do you think you are that people would care to listen to whatever you have, to, whatever you've made, um, those sorts of things. And you just have to get over that and say, this isn't about me. It's not about my value. It's about right. the song, which I do, which I'm proud of. And that I do think has something good to say, you mm -hmm. know? And yeah. That inner dialogue. Things, yeah. It's so tough. We're so tough on ourselves as creatives. We talked about that earlier, like putting, uh, if you put your worth in your songs and like how people like your song is how they like you, it's, it's not connected, it's separate. And so um, I just thought it was interesting. Like I'll put out some music and people's responses will be probably different than what I expect, or even like 
I have a certain perspective on what it is about. And then other people are like, oh, wow, it relates to me in a totally different way. And I don't know that until I put it out there. And so sometimes the things that you think are going to be like really popular are just a flop. And then there's something that is like a last minute thing, or you just kind of, uh, you know, add it on at the end. And that's what everyone loves. And so it's interesting to me, like how people respond to it once you put it out into the world. Yeah, totally. And I, I would say as an encouragement, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, it's hard work and it takes time, but like, go like follow someone on Instagram who you think is doing it well and kind of study it, you know, like, okay, this is what they did putting out their record. They got an interview with this people with this magazine. How do I do that? Like, is there, do, is there anyone I know who's a friend of a friend of a friend who, you know, um, or, are, you know, what magazine can I get an interview with? Can I, do I have a friend who would just ask me some questions and maybe that would be a good thing depending on where you're coming from or where you're starting at. And, um, but you can just study their, their um, strategies for it because the more um, kind of the larger the act, the more effort, um, there's just more people working on it. And so you can look and say, okay, well, they're posting three times a day, every day. I don't want to do that or I can't do that. Okay, cool. What can you do? Um, you can mix it up. It, like you said earlier, you can kind of share, you can be intentional about like, I want to do lyrics on Mondays and I want to um, do a video, a short video on Thursdays. And um, if I'm going to release my record on this day, then I need to backtrack three months and put on my calendar. I need to release the first single on this day and I need to promote the first single in these ways. So once again, it's not it's not rocket science, it's super simple. It's just a lot of legwork. Um, and you, and it's, it stems from really believing in what you're doing. You know, if you really love it and you really do think it's, it's gonna be helpful for people, then you're gonna put in the time to, um, uh, to um, let it speak for yourself, as you said, and give it a chance um, to help people. Or to or to serve its function. I for my for me, it's often to help people. Is why I'm releasing music. Once again, it's not a lesser calling if your music is to make someone smile or to help them dance or to get a chick or whatever it is. You know, I think I think that's okay too. Um, it's just once again, it's about that intention and about um, kind of knowing why you're doing what you're doing and then going for it. Believing, it in an, believing in it enough to go really like push and go for it. Yeah, that speaks volumes. And I think people can tell. They can tell when you are real and when you are in it, when you believe in your music and when you know why you're doing it. So thanks for sharing that encouragement. Let our listeners know where they can find you online so they can follow your music. Tell us about your latest release as well so they can listen to that. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, well, so I just put out a new song. Um, it's called Blessed Be The Name. And it's the first single from my new record, which is called I'll Wait For You, My Love. And it's a collection of what I call um, new old hymns, um, songs that are rich in content and tradition, but their functional purposes have grown dormant. Um, and this song, Blessed Be The Name, uh, was a staple at my home church growing up. And it's a chief example of a song with a really potent text that has just become kind of musically obsolete. So I applied a new musical treatment to it and I hope it will lend the song new life. Um, I'm pretty into that process. So, um, so that's the new single and cool. you'll be able to, um, you can get it at greglafollett.com. Um, spell that for us. Yeah, so, <laughs> for anybody listening, uh, spell it out. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a G R E G L A capital F. You don't really have to put the capital in there, but <laughs> it's there. Uh, L-A-F-O-L-L-E-T-T-E dot com. Um, and I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Twitter, and all the things, and Spotify. And they can find all those links on your website, right? Correct. Yeah. So go to the website, get connected on social media, follow Greg's music, go check out the newest single, Blessed Be the Name. Greg, thank you for your time today on the show and sharing some stories and some tips. I really appreciate your time being here today. Yeah, easy. Thanks for having me. 
Thank you so much for listening. I hope you got a lot out of this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for even more episodes coming soon. Also, if you're a songwriter or independent musician, you should definitely check out the other podcast episodes where I interview different songwriters in the music industry and they share about what they've learned. So you can check that out by going to rusticsongbird.com forward slash podcast. All right, make sure to hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next video.